The January 16th meeting of the Eden Prairie City Council will now come to order. Please all rise for the Pledge of Allegiance. I pledge allegiance to the flag of the United States of America and to the republic for which it stands, one nation, under God, indivisible, with liberty and justice for all. Prior to the start of each city council meeting, we have an opportunity for residents to address the council on a less formal basis on items that are not on the agenda that evening. This portion of the meeting is generally about 6.30 to 7, or to 6.55, and if you wish to address the council at that time, your best bet is to reserve a slot by contacting the city manager's office at 949-8410, no, 12, sorry. And, you can call uh, either of those numbers. <laughs> and leave your name, your phone number, and the subject matter you wish to discuss. After scheduled speakers, we open up the floor to unscheduled speakers. This portion of the meeting is not televised, nor is it recorded. Again, if you have any questions, please contact the city manager's office at 9498412. Um, to start off the meeting, we are having a um, HRA meeting, so I'd like to call the HRA meeting to order. Is there a motion to approve the minutes of the HRA meeting held on June, or pardon me, on January 2nd? Motion so, approval. Second. Any items to correct? Hearing none, all in favor? Aye. 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 The motion passes. The next item is asking for approval of the revised pooled TIF note and mortgage and the revised park dedication note and mortgage for the Elevate TIF development agreement. Mr. Getcho. Uh, thank you, members of the HRA. So we have some housekeeping that we need to do, uh, updating on the Elevate project at that Southwest Station, the uh, mixed-use housing project. So we need to amend and restate the uh, tax increment development agreement, uh, mainly three for three main reasons in housekeeping. One, I think, as the mayor mentioned, as it relates to payment of park dedication fees. Secondly, we need to extend the obligation um, to December 31st, uh, 2060. And uh, third, we need to add language that's required by HUD uh, related to subordinate financing repayments of surplus cash. So um, there are no other uh, changes, but the uh, request is to authorize the execution of the amended and restated tax increment development agreement. Okay. Is there, are there any questions? No. Is there a motion? I would move to approve the revised pooled TIF note and mortgage and the revised park dedication note and mortgage for the Elevate TIF development agreement. Second. All in favor? Aye. 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 Motion passes. Is there a motion to adjourn the HRA meeting? Move to adjourn. Second. All in favor? Aye. 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 Uh, the HRA meeting is adjourned. Uh, we'll, we're back into the city council meeting and we're going to start out the evening with a uh, proclamation for the Eden Prairie Eagles football team, naming this Eden Prairie Eagles football day. And this is not the kind of thing that we generally do. A lot of times the, the attainments of the students at our schools, we let the school district handle that. But this is just such an amazing tradition of excellence that has come through with our Eden Prairie football programs that we just felt the, the need, the desire to recognize this group this particular year. Um, I, I'm sure Coach Grant would say it's not just him. I'm sure he would attribute a lot of the success, not only to his great players and his great coaching staff, but also to the effort, efforts of the Eden Prairie Football Association, which is a group that, that the city um, works quite a bit with in getting play, uh, field time and um, facilities for them. So it's very much a community effort to develop a team of this caliber. And at this time, um, I'm going to read a proclamation and then we would like to have um, Coach Grant, Principal McCartan, and the team captains to come up to receive the proclamation and um, uh, have some pictures taken. So, whereas the City Council of Eden Prairie, Minnesota is proud to recognize the achievements of residents in our community, and whereas the 2017 Eden Prairie High School football team played in Class 6A, Minnesota's top football classification, under the outstanding leadership of head coach Mike Grant, and whereas the 2017 Eden Prairie High School football team won seven, or 13 straight games to establish a record of 13-0, and, and whereas the 2017 Eden Prairie High School football team flew to a 38-17 victory over Minnetonka High School on November 24, 2017, to win their 
State Best 11th State Championship. Now therefore I, Nancy Tira Lukens, Mayor of Eden Prairie, Minnesota, do hereby recognize the Eden Prairie Eagles and coaching staff of Coach Mike Grant for their achievements throughout the 2017 high school football season. And with great pleasure, I do hereby declare January 16, 2018 as Eden Prairie Eagles Football Day in the city of Eden Prairie and encourage our residents to join me in congratulating the team on their success in 2017. So, um, Mr. Grant and Mr. McCartan. And <laughs> wearing her Viking colors yeah. just uh yeah. <laughs> oh you're talking about that other football yes <laughs> another one oh, yeah. not a successful as you. yours yeah oh there it is oh there it is oh. Okay. catch him yeah Did somebody go Joyce Uh, Mr. Getchell, the next item is the <clears throat> SA Highway 61 Flying Cloud Drive Findings Interpretive Plan. Uh, thank you, Mayor and Council. I'm going to introduce Lori Creamer, our staff liaison to the Heritage Preservation Commission, and she'll kick us off on the next presentation. Thank you, Mr. Getchell. Good evening, Mayor, Council members, and all of our guests tonight. Um, I'm Lori Creamer. I'm the staff liaison for the Heritage Preservation Commission. And I have the privilege, privilege of introducing our guest speaker tonight, um, speakers, excuse me. Um, they're gonna share uh, with you tonight some of the discoveries that they made while preparing for the upcoming Hennepin County 61 Flying Cloud Drive Road Project. Um, I'd like to introduce Jason Stabell. He's a senior project manager for Hennepin County. And he's been the design project manager on this project. And then also Steve Boyd-Smith is the creative director at the 106 Group. And he's leading the interpretation of the new discoveries for the project. Please help me welcome Jason and Steve. <laughs> Thank you, Lori. Um, again, my name is Jason Stabell. I'm with uh, Hennepin County and the project manager for this uh, reconstruction project. And uh, we do have a presentation that we'll bring up. And so some of you are familiar with Connor Road 61, Flying Cloud Drive. Um, it goes from, the reconstruction project goes from Charleston Road all the way to 101 in Chanhassen. Um, you can go to the next slide. So as I said, uh, there's a project location. So um, I'll keep my point brief because you really want to hear Steve's in information. So you can go to the next slide. Uh, so Hennepin County led, Carver County has been involved. We've been working closely with Eden Prairie and Chanhassen, uh, Mindan. Uh, 
uh, U.S. Fish and Wildlife, Army Corps of Engineers, DNR, and uh, Bowser have been some of the project organizations. And so here's a rendering of the project. When we're complete, it'll be a three-lane section. Currently, it's a two-lane section. Uh, one lane in each direction and a center left turn lane. Uh, there'll be also a bike pedestrian trail on the north side. And you can see uh, some significant retaining walls to um, lessen the impacts to the bluffs on the north side of 61. So just some broad numbers, you know, 3.7 miles, there's 9,000 square feet of retaining wall, there's two major bridges with a uh, significant bridge deck, a lot of new guardrail, um, and so it's a big project. Um, I started at the county in 2013, and it's now just been bid, so I've been working on that for that long, mm -hmm. and uh, hopefully this, we have a contractor uh, that we're working through the award process with, and uh, February, March, we should start getting out there and uh, moving some ground. But through the process, we've had um, the 106 group help us with uh, some archeological um, studies and uh, <coughs> digs through the um, corridor, and Steve will talk more about that, and sometime in his presentation, I'll show you some of the artifacts. Hello, and thank you for having us here. Uh, so I'm Steve Boyd-Smith. I'm the creative director at the 106 Group. The 106 Group is based in St. Paul. We are a cultural resources uh, company. So we have archaeologists, and we also have uh, architectural historians, and we do interpretation, in this case, meaning exterior exhibits. Uh, so I'm not an archaeologist. I'm doing my part to try to explain their thing. If there are questions that I can't answer, then uh, I'll be happy to follow up with the archaeologists. But essentially, the archaeology uh, along this three-mile corridor started, uh, there's um, industry standards of three phases of archaeology. The first of these had 895 shovel tests along the three miles and uh, 76 core samples, so greater than 10 foot deep, uh, 10 meter deep samples. That discovered nine sites that needed additional survey. That uh, then meant an additional 106 uh, um, shovel tests that are closer into each other, and then 20 square meter excavation units. And then that determined that there were another six sites that needed uh, additional excavation. So there were 73 square meters of uh, excavation and controlled stripping, which is um, observation of the of some uh, soil being pulled away in the larger areas by machines. What all that found was 5,000 artifacts. It's a very significant find. Uh, these artifacts are lithics, so stone tools animal remains, which tell us a lot about, you know, obviously the animals in the area, but also about what people were eating and about seasonality because, you, you know, the seasonality of the animals and what people are eating relate. And ceramics. Uh, what we have in terms of ceramics, and Jason will start showing some around. We need to keep these in the case because uh, they are sensitive objects, but uh, certainly happy to show them. They are um, the, the... Can you pass it? Can we, I mean... Maybe, can he go up there? Can he come up behind? Yeah. Okay. Of course. So um, the ceramics represent a lot of different styles, which tells us a lot about different times. It also tells us about uh, trade and, and exchange of information. What this site... Uh, oh, I'm sorry, and then there's one other piece, is that it's not only the objects that come out of the ground, it's also the features that you find on the site. So we had 19 features, fire pits, post holes, evidence of, um, of occupation of the area. The significance of this, and this is all being written up in great big thick reports that I can't read, 
but the evidence d demonstrates the continuous presence of indigenous people in this place over at least 1,300 years. This is not particularly surprising. Um, we know this is the Minnesota River, and there's, it's very small on the map, but the project area is there um, in a little box. Um, there are Dakota sites all along the Minnesota River. There are um, mounds all along the Minnesota River. There's historical record referencing um, all sorts of different Dakota sites along the Minnesota River, including uh, some uh, early maps that show Chief Sakpe or Chief Shakopee's village on the south side of the river and uh, the Taliaferro map shows it on the north side of the river, so in this area. So my part of the deal, as I said, is I'm the exhibits person, so when a find like this happens, there is mitigation that needs to occur. That includes uh, the preservation of the artifacts. It means the publishing of very thick documents that I can't read. And it also means telling this, uh, conveying this information to the public in a format that is, that makes sense. So that means that we will do interpretation. So we are uh, in the early stages of planning a uh, series of waysides uh, around a plaza, like in the bottom right. Um, with some audio posts above, the audio posts provide accessibility, audio description. They will also give us room for some oral history. And these are currently planned to be uh, next to the parking at the Richard T. Anderson Conservation Area. And that's what I've got. Very exciting. Thank you. Thank you. How deep are most of these artifacts? See, that's a good question that I don't know the answer to. Actually, uh, the, the pits, the, the holes where they found most of them, or, I'm sorry, what, that started the dig, so the phase one archaeology was like one meter, one meter right? Mm -hmm. They like uh, to talk in metrics. Yes, I don't know okay. why the metrics were there. Uh, any other questions? Council Member Butcher Wickstrom. Yes, very, very interesting, and I'm so impressed by the size of the artifacts. Mm -hmm. and the variety of, um, you know, um, cord wrap paddle and all the <laughs> different uh, textures on the outside. So my question is, you know, we've been collecting information, um, our Heritage Preservation Commission, our Historical Society, our local Historical Society, mm -hmm. and also the Minnesota mm -hmm. Historical Society, a lot of information about the past of, of um, this geographic region. So my question for you is, now that you're adding greater information or more information to what our story already is or what mm -hmm. we believe our story to be, mm -hmm. so how will you drop that in? I mean, how will, how will what you have found, um, how will you bring the bigger picture to, to the overall story? Do you understand my question? I'm, I'll try to respond and you can Yeah, because it's, not just, it's not just a point in time, not just the Mississippian period or you know, right. whatever we're dealing right. with. Right. It's, it's far greater than that. You know, we've got a lot of burial mounds. We've got a lot of information about what this place is. So it would be great if, if it could be more of a comprehensive picture uh, than fact, just a, a snapshot. Okay, I understand. I think I understand your question. So um, one of the aspects of this project is that there has been consultation with the Dakota tribes. Um, and they are asking, they are suggesting the same thing. Mm -hmm. They would like this to not be just thought of as there's this site and this thing happened here, but that there is a, um, it's contiguous with our other sites. So the, you know, the, let's see if I can get up. Maybe not. So the um, plaza that I showed the, in the bottom right, that's actually um, in Dakota County, but we would do something similar here that shows a map that makes larger connections. Because of course to the Dakota, this is not, um, yeah, the, the, the range is much wider. It's not just Eden Prairie. I absolutely understand that. Right. Yeah. Um, it's just so nice to be able to, whether it's 
um, you know, another county or whether it's Hennepin County, it's really nice to be able to sort of share a bigger story, mm -hmm. I guess is what I'm trying to say. So I also know that that is not what you were given to do in this particular project. <laughs> but um, I don't know, maybe we could find some funding to do a, a larger, you know, sort of a larger piece that I would adds love to talk about that. your information in it along with all the other information. I think We've had many archaeological surveys done. We've yeah. got a lot of stories mm -hmm. that would be nice to piece together in a larger quilt, I guess. I'd be happy to talk about that. That would be fun. <laughs> Councilmember Case. Yeah, I want to piggyback on that uh, as well. I'm, I'm glad to hear, very, really glad to hear that the indigenous people are very, the representatives today are very interested in having their story continue to be told and, and that you would play a part in that. And we also, besides representing that perspective, also represent the perspective of people today. And you have all those mm -hmm. incredibly wonderful artifacts. So the first question is, officially, who owns them? I know where they, where they go, which is to the state archaeologist. OK. I, I, I thought that was accurate. And I guess my question, we might then be dealing with them that agency but how great would it be to have on loan and we could actually put some money uh into some kind of a glass case outside that that you know for the next five years or something would display um but if we if you maybe could help us be part of that in connection to whoever officially has control of those today i think uh i i just as much as I appreciate um, safeguarding them into a box, into a cavern, into a basement, sure. whatever, I'd love to have it available. Uh, and this is pretty exciting. We have we found a, quite a few artifacts over the hundreds of years of settler history here uh, of indigenous people. But this is probably um, one of the larger um, is cash a good word? Caches that we have cash whatever have help me has come have come across, and I'd love to see it available to the people of Eden Prairie. So if we could somehow make that happen, and I, I don't know, I'll leave that with you, Rick, and then uh, help you know connect with whoever museum. we need to connect with. Put it in our museum. Yeah. Could uh, could, and that's not a bad place. And then I would get traffic down there too. But I also envision maybe maybe the. You raise a good point. Maybe we need to have more of cases up here that would actually get some some uh, artifacts from the museum occasionally coming up because I think it's hard yeah. for people to find sometimes their way down there. And so, <laughs> but um, yes, so nice maybe you'll be part of something larger here. So thank you. Thank you so much, Jason and Steve, for coming out today. Yeah. I really appreciate My pleasure. seeing thank the you. artifacts in person. Thank you. Yeah, thank you. Uh, uh, Jay, you have a. A list. Accepting a donation, a, a bunch of donations. Yes. Very generous one. Your Honor, Council Members, our first donation tonight is uh, $5,000 from Eden Prairie Smiles. This is an uh, annual and ongoing contribution that goes towards uh, several our, of our events, but it's one that really assists us with the 3rd and 4th of July. And I didn't see if Dr. Mesa, yes, there. Thank you, Dr. Mesa. We'd love to recognize you. Appreciate it. We, we appreciate the uh, annual gift, and uh, again, it makes these uh, programs much better, and uh, we'll give uh, lots of recognitions as these events uh, move forward. Okay. So this donation goes towards the Hometown Celebration on July 3rd and 4th, starring at, starring at Starring, concert series, Kid Stock, Halloween on the Mall, and the Fall Harvest Celebration. So thank you, okay. Dr. Mesa, for that. Is there a motion? I would move to adopt the resolution accepting the donation from Eden Prairie Smiles for $5,000 for Parks and Recreation Special Events. Second. Mm -hmm. All in favor? Aye. 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 The motion passes. Again, thank you so much. Uh, next, Mr. Lathammer. Yes, yeah, so uh, the Lion's Tap, a local restaurant, um, wishes to make contributions to multiple events, a uh, total of $2,300. And uh, those events are the uh, Winter Blast, Winter Theater, Art Crawl, Fall into Fitness, Flick and Float, Floating Pumpkin Patch, Indoor Triathlon, Summer Musical, and the Arbor Day Walk and Green Fair. So 
appreciate their uh, support with those events. There's another oh, whole list. You're <laughs> right. Uh, 3rd and 4th of July, the Arts in the Park, Fall Harvest, Halloween on the Mall, Kidstock Concerts, Starring Lake Concert Series, Animal Open House, Movies in the Park, and Spooky Saturday. So that uh, does get divided up um, to all of those events and uh, are recognized in, in small ways at each one of those. Okay. Is there a motion? I move to adopt the resolution accepting the donation from Lions Tap in the amount of $2,300 for Parks and Recreation Special Events. Second. All in favor? Aye. 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 Well, thanks to Lions Tap, another generous donation. Uh, next, Mr. Ladhammer. Yes, the uh, Lioness Club, a $750 donation, and that's towards our efforts at Pioneer Park, which is located directly behind the Senior Center and it's to help us create more of an intergenerational play experience. So right now you're familiar with the tennis and pickleball courts. Um, just across the trail towards the new orchard, fruit tree orchard over there, we're gonna add some bag toss and also some bocce. And this will uh, go towards uh, that project. And not just a gathering place uh, for seniors that may be overflow from pickleball, and giving them extra opportunities. And uh, it's also a place where I think families will gather. We'll be providing the bags, the bocce equipment, also as we already provide uh, some of the pickleball for maybe those families that want to try it out and have uh, kind of that more nighttime activity. So thank the Lioness Group for that. That's great. It's our motion. I would move to adopt the resolution accepting the donation from the Eden Prairie Lioness Club in the amount of $750 towards Pioneer Park enhancements. Second. All in favor? Aye. 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 The motion passes. Another donation. Yeah, this $600. is $600 from the uh, School of Rock, and it's going towards the um, Winter Blast. I'm having trouble with that one because we have for a long time called it Rock on Ice. So Winter Blast is the new name for this year. And then also for our Kids Stock uh, series coming up in the summertime. So appreciate their donation. Isn't School of Rock in Chanhassen? You know, I am not sure if they have an Eden Prairie presence Maybe they or do. not. Maybe they do not. Yeah. Okay. We'll Another great donation. Is there a motion to accept? I, I would move to adopt the resolution accepting the donation of $600 from School of Rock to go towards the Winter Blast event and Kid Stock. All in favor? Aye. 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 Motion oh, passes. Is there a second? Yeah. Second. Oh, I'm sorry. I don't know. Was there a second? No, there wasn't. I didn't second. <laughs> Somebody did. Just guess. Councilmember no. Nelson <laughs> seconded. Uh, is there an. Uh, Mr. Lathammer, another donation. Yes, uh, $500 from the Lions Club, Eden Prairie Lions Club, and this goes towards our wood shop, both for some uh, equipment and materials, but also for training. And the wood shop at the Senior Center, formerly the uh, council chambers, turned into a wood shop now, is very popular, and not just with our older adults, but also with families. Um, as the Pinewood Derby rolls around, um, there's a lot of uh, kids that are there that are assisted. So the training is a big part. In order to use it, you do have to have a one-time safety training, but uh, it's pretty easy to be involved with. So we thank the Lions Club. Is there a motion? Move to adopt the resolution accepting the donation of $500 from the Eden Prairie Lions Club for wood shop training and equipment at the Eden Prairie Senior Center. Second. All in favor? Aye. 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 Thank you again to the Lions. A uh, $400 donation from the Lions Club. Uh, this one is for Starring Lake Outdoor Center and for a puppet stage. And I was able to see it in use today by a picture. We had uh, 40 kindergartners and they were learning about the habits of animals in the winter. And they were, as I was told, enthralled by the puppets and it really captivated their attention on how different animals in Minnesota weather through the winter or hibernate through the winter. Um, so it was pretty exciting for our staff. And the best part about this um, puppet theater stage is that it can be easily collapsed and taken out to other events. So look for it at some of our 4th of July, 3rd of July, those types of events as well. Okay, thank you. Is there a motion? Sure, I move to adopt the resolution accepting the donation of $400 from Eden Prairie Lions Club for the Starring Lake Outdoor Center programs. Second. All in favor? Aye. 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 Uh, final one, 
Yes, $250 from the Dentists of Eden Prairie towards the Winter Blast event. So appreciate their donation. Is there a motion? Move, Move to, to adopt the resolution accepting the donation of $250 from the Dentists of Eden Prairie for the Winter Blast event. Second. All in favor? Aye. 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 The motion passes. Thank you to the Dentists of Eden Prairie and all of the other donors. Our total donations, that's almost $10,000 in donations that we're accepting tonight, which is really wonderful. Jay appreciates that. It lets him keep his staff busy planning different programs <laughs> and events and uh, that would not happen were it not for some of these donations. So thank you. Um, Dr. Martin Luther King Day uh, was yesterday. The office was closed. Mr. Getcho, did you want to elaborate on that? Uh, Mayor, yes, I'd like to uh, introduce uh, Greg Leeper, the vice chair of our Human Rights and Diversity Commission, and he will um, talk about the, or actually, I see, okay, I see the chair of our Human Rights and Diversity Commission, Sana Elisar, is here. And uh, she will announce the opening of the application for our Human Rights Awards. And then following that, uh, Mary, you uh, could read the proclamation. Okay. Thank you. Respected Mayor and Council Members, good evening. My name is Sana Alizar, and as Chair of the Human Rights and Diversity Commission, it is my pleasure to announce the start of the Human Rights Award process with this year, year 2018. We are in 2018. Uh, the goal of the Human Rights Award is to recognize Eden Prairie individuals, nonprofit organizations, businesses, and youth who have worked to create an inclusive community spirit through their actions, activities, or programs. There are many talented individuals in our community, as you know. So the HRDC, which is the Human Rights and Diversity Commission, is proud and honored to be able to recognize those who embody the Eden Prairie Manifesto. Applications for the Human Rights Awards can be found on the City of Eden Prairie's website and nominations will be accepted until February 28th of this year. Additionally, applications are also available in accessible and alternate formats upon request. The Human Rights and Diversity Commission will review all submitted nominations and select award recipients during our March meeting. Uh, once the recipients are selected, the Human Rights Awards will be presented during one of these council meetings in May. So thank you so much for giving me the opportunity to make this an announcement. Thank you, I appreciate it. Um, I will read that proclamation now. Uh, whereas the City of Eden Prairie City Council and Human Rights and Diversity Commission sponsors the Human Rights Award Program, recognizing those who work to create an inclusive community spirit through their actions, activities, and programs, and whereas the City of Eden Prairie recognizes that Dr. Martin Luther King Jr. had a dream and dedicated his life to helping freedom exist for all people through his commitment to human rights and his nonviolent philosophy. And whereas the City of Eden Prairie reaffirms its commitment to fostering diversity in our community through the Eden Prairie Man Manifesto, now therefore be it resolved that the City of Eden Prairie hereby proclaims 2018 as a year to celebrate human rights and diversity and asks all residents to continue their commitment and concern for equal rights for all persons, to dedicate themselves to helping those who do not yet share in that freedom, and to join the city of Eden Prairie in recognizing and celebrating Dr. Martin Luther King Jr.'s dream. So thank you, and um, please consider your friends, your neighbors, your organizations you belong to as possible nominations for this Human Rights and Diversity Award. Thank you, Sana. Uh, the next item is a presentation on the Energy Action Plan for Sust Sustainable Eden Prairie. Mr. Getcho, did you want to add anything to that? Uh, maybe just to uh, queue up Marissa Bayer, our Community Development Coordinator, and Beth Novak Krebs, our Senior Planner, who are going to give a presentation on our Energy Action Plan. Um, Madam Mayor and Council, uh, so again, my name is Marissa Bear. I'm the Community Development Coordinator with the City. Beth Novak Krebs is here with me tonight, our Senior Planner, and we'll be giving you an update on our Energy Action Plan and the work we've been doing over the past few months to really kick off our implementation. So first, I'd like to just remind you of the work that we've done. Um, the City participated in Excel Energy's Partners in Energy program um, to help collaborate and develop the plan itself. We uh, 
the energy action team energy action team was developed um, and Beth and I were a part of that and we worked together as a team to develop goals and strategies and identify focus areas the energy action team was um, consisted of residents and community leaders from various business organizations city commissions and city governments we had a pretty good representation of the community itself the plan itself prioritizes three focus areas we have residential energy commercial um, and large industrial users and then public, nonprofit, and service buildings. Um, the plan was approved by the Conservation Commission and the Council itself in September 2017. The plan, um, the Energy Action Team together developed a shared vision for the plan itself and had these guiding principles that I think you'll see reflected in the implementation strategies that Beth will go in a little bit more detail about. But kind of the key things we were looking at were cost savings, feasible solutions, measurable results, inclusive engagement among our residents, education within our residents and business community, supporting our businesses and gr helping grow our businesses as well, and then also protecting our natural environment that our community really values. So with that, I'll hand it off to Beth um, to talk about our implementation strategies. So our first focus area was residential use users. And the first thing we did was we conducted a survey of residents um, to see what residents think about energy and how they use energy. And we had more than 400 responses, which was a really good response rate. We've collaborated with our communications department to create some residential marketing, uh, marketing material and a plan. And we created some new residential marketing materials that we can hand out in the um, new homeowners packets that we hand out and to put on the website and social uh, media. Um, the city budgeted $10,000 to reduce the cost of 200 um, home energy squad enhanced visits. Um, they're normally $100 and they would, for the first 200 people, would be $50 and um, you can easily sign up online at homeenergysquad.net. Um, we're partnering with the Housing and Community Services Division to highlight energy efficiency upgrade, upgrades in the home rehab uh, program materials. Uh, we're trying to connect with multifamily building owners to talk about energy upgrades and to create low-income housing resource material. Um, we've developed some new resource, a new resource guide for residential remodeling that um, can be put over by building inspections department. Um, we put an article in Life in the Prairie about holiday uh, energy saving tips. And we will continue to promote the mayor's home energy squad visit to encourage others to sign up. The second uh, area is large commercial and industrial buildings. Uh, we've updated the website to be a resource guide for financing and rebate opportunities. Uh, we want some of these uh, large commercial and industrial buildings um, owners to know what, what's available and what's out there. We're collaborating with the Economic Development um, a Division. They have monthly meet and greets and we want to provide energy conservation materials um, that they can hand out at their meet and greets. We're creating a rebate flyer that can be put at the building inspections counter. We're working with Building Owners and Managers Association to co-host some events with other um, partner in energy cities. And we're hiring an intern to support um, business outreach and engagement. And in fact, tomorrow we have our, our first face-to-face uh, -face interviews. And the last area of focus is public, nonprofit, and service organizations. We've created case studies for the school district and Margaret A. Cargill Philanthropies to highlight best practices and really showcase um, what others can do. Um, the Conservation Commission is currently reaching out to local congregations to start making connections and building relationships so that we can start having some conversations about energy conservation. And we're also identifying city buildings that are good candidates for solar. And we're exploring off-site solar garden subscriptions. So we have been um, busy sort of laying the groundwork um, so that we can move forward and meet our energy goals. 
Mm. And then also um, wanted to talk a little bit, kind of looking ahead. So this is a lot of the work that we've done over the past few months. The Partners in Energy process is over the year of 2018, so we have the next 12 months to do a lot of these activities, continue our work. And some of the things we'll be working on in the next few months is developing a citywide energy challenge, so kind of similar to the water challenge, except no one will be winning a car or thousands of dollars. <laughs> um, but trying to think through, um, and we'll be working with Partners in Energy, because some other cities have done something similar. Um, we'll be developing education workshops for residents of what they can do in their home and energy saving tips that they can implement that are pretty easy and accessible. Um, we'll be developing lunch and learns with facility managers and then property owners and managers about the types of programs that are available for improvements that they can make in their building and really focusing on the return on investments of these energy upgrades. We'll be tabling at the Chamber um, Expo in March uh, and the Conservation Commission and Beth will be helping with that. Um, we'll be capitalizing on already existing citywide events and using those as outreach opportunities to get out into the community and help educate about what opportunities exist for residents as it relates to energy and natural gas conservation. And then we're also looking to partner with the school district to try and get into the schools and engage with students because we see a lot of activity that the students can do. They can bring that home, especially with the younger population. Um, you know, you have a first grader, they learn about energy, really simple tips. They're definitely going to share that with their family when they get home. And that's what we have for you tonight. Any questions? Okay. Thank you. Any questions yeah. for Marissa and Beth? It sounds like you've been very busy. Yeah. <laughs> I noticed right. on your list that you have plans to promote the energy audits at the spring. Yep, what is the, it? Expo? The chamber, the home and garden. Yeah. Expo. Yep. And hopefully we'll get those 200 um, reduced price <laughs> audits done yes. or scheduled by then. Yeah, so we actually, as of last week, 46 visits have already been scheduled oh. and we have not actually oh. advertised this yet. So um, I think we'll, the 200 visits, I think will be taken okay. up pretty quickly. Even at $100, it's, yep, it's such a, great deal. a bargain. I had it done the other day. And you know you prepare for it thinking it's like a test and you don't want to fail the test. But really, <laughs> you kind of want to know what's wrong with your house and the, the areas where you're losing heat um, or overusing um, fuel. But I mean, they came in, they did a heat loss test in the whole house. They checked the attic insulation. insulation. They would have replaced the thermostat if we hadn't done that last year. They wrapped our hot water heater in a blanket they replaced shower heads with higher um, efficiency, lower water use, higher pressure shower heads. They did the same for a couple of faucets. They weather stripped a door um, and they replaced 44 LED bulbs for a hundred dollars. Are you kidding? You can, yeah. I mean, I mean, I'm, it's offered now for 50 if you go through our program, yeah. if you're one of the 200 that gets scheduled. It's amazing. But even after that, a hundred dollars, you could not do this in your house for $100. Absolutely. Mm -hmm. yep. So yeah. it's a no-brainer. Everybody yeah. needs to sign up. Yeah, and all Eden Prairie re residents are eligible for the program, so it's a really great opportunity yeah. um, to, I mean, for $100, you get a lot of uh, a lot of services. <laughs> so. A lot of services. Wow. Yeah, yeah. Well, thank, thank you, you very, very much. much. Nice. Oh, um, Council Member Nelson, you had a question? Oh, yeah, I was just going to say thank you for making sure that the city is continuing with the original energy program from this summer and that things are starting to get done and the various programs are going because that's how this will be successful. Yeah. Thank you for your work. All right, is there a motion for approval of the agenda and other items of business? Move I approval. Second. I can't believe we're just doing this part of the meeting. I know. <laughs> <laughs> uh, any items to change or anything to drop? Okay. All in favor? Aye. 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 Motion passes. Is there a motion to approve the minutes from the City Council workshop held on Tuesday, January 2nd? Move approval. Second. Any corrections to those? Hearing none, all in favor? Aye. 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 The motion passes. Is there a motion for approval of the minutes from the City Council meeting held that same date? So moved. Second. Any corrections to those minutes? Hearing none, all in favor? Aye. 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 The motion passes. Consent calendar. Move approval of items A to G on the consent calendar. Second. Any items to pull for discussion? Hearing none, all in favor? Aye. 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 The motion passes. We have one public hearing tonight. It's South View of Eden Prairie. Mr. Getchell. Uh, thank you, Mayor and Council Members. Yes, our one public hearing is South View at Eden Prairie. This is a proposed uh, five-story, 116-unit uh, senior residence at the southwest corner of the intersection of Prairie Center Drive and Franlow Road. Um, the building proposed includes independent assisted living and memory care units. 
the uh, building faces Franlo Road would also include underground parking and some surface parking on the south and east side of the building. The proposal also includes a number of indoor and outdoor amenities for residents, such as a theater, a fitness center, a library, a salon, a patio area, outdoor seating area, and a water feature. The consideration tonight, uh, city council members, is a resolution amending our guide plan from regional commercial to high density residential, amending our comprehensive uh, plan text, our text of our comprehensive plan to a land use category that would allow over 40 dwelling units per acre. Also a PUD concept review and a zoning district change on the 2.58 acres at the location that I just covered. The project proponent is here this evening to provide a presentation and an overview of the project. And then the uh, applicant and the city staff are here to answer any questions that the council or the public may have uh, during the public hearing. Thank you. Good evening, Mayor and members of the City Council. My name is Mindy Michael. I'm with Cost Wilson Architects, the designers uh, for this proposed project. Uh, thank you for having us here this evening to talk with you about uh, this exciting new project for the City of Eden Prairie. Um, with us this evening, we've got Lance Lemieux and Ben Welna from Southview Senior Communities. Lance is the president. Um, also here is uh, Scott Carlson involved with development team as well as Link Wilson and Christian Borgen as well from Cost Wilson. Excuse me. Move on. Uh, there's no dispute that there's quite a need for senior living throughout the Twin Cities metro area, the state and the nation. Uh, the image to the upper left of this slide just illustrates graphically the rising trend in the age population um, coming up here in the next 10, 20, 30, 40 years. Um, the uh, age bracket of about 85 plus is oftentimes the uh, demographic that you see in buildings such as this. Um, and to the right is just some stats from, provided from the Met Council for our region stating that between the years of 2010 and 2030, uh, the number of people aged 65 and better is going to double and by 2040, one in three uh, residents within the Twin Cities metro area will be aged 65 and better. Uh, Southview Senior Living has been uh, operate, owning and operating buildings throughout the Twin Cities metro area for uh, over 12 years. They've got 11 buildings in the area that they currently own and operate, uh, and about almost half of them, uh, Cost Wilson has been uh, fortunate enough to be a partner in, in designing those buildings. Um, and in owning and operating the buildings, they're really interested in the long-term um, uh, sustainability and operations of the building. They're not just a developer that comes and hires someone else to manage the building for them. They're in, that, they're in it for the long run. Uh, we've held a neighborhood meeting with the adjacent neighbors, uh, many of which were very much in support of the projects, thought this was a great partner and, and neighbor to have next to them. Uh, several of them came out to speak at the pub public hearing at the Planning Commission. Um, and throughout this process, we've worked with city staff to um, work on the right away accommodations for Medcombe Boulevard on the south side of the site, and also working through um, uh, the comments that city planning staff and engineering staff have had throughout the process. To orient ourselves to the site just real quickly, graphically, as noted, this is on the southeast, or excuse me, southwest corner of Franlow Road and Prairie Center Drive. And this site really is kind of a transition zone between the commercial development that's surrounding it and the residential development that's to the south. Um, this site itself has set, uh, set uh, for quite some years. Um, not being redeveloped as there's been a lot of development around it uh, with some single family homes just currently on the site. And it's been that way for a number of reasons. Um, <coughs> one being that it's a very challenging site in and of itself. There's a lot of topography change on the site. There's about 40 feet of elevation change across the site in certain areas. Uh, there's the shape of it and the size of it is a little bit um, unusual. And as well, it has uh, limited vehicular access, really the only spot being um, along Franlow Road where we're showing the proposed access site, which also happens to be also the high point of the site. So getting then down 
into the site um, requires some length of drive to do so. And we'll get into that a little bit later. As noted before, the proposed building is five stories, 116 units, 32 of which are memory care, 44 independent, and 40 assisted living units. Um, within the proposed density, it it's also proposed to include um, a total of 12 affordable units. Um, and these affordable units are um, made possible through the density that we're requesting. Uh, the project is not requiring or requesting any public funds, is not pursuing any tax credits of any sort. It's just um, part of the project that we're proposing this. And a quick tour of the building, as noted, we've got a full garage of underground parking included within the building. Um, generally, this is reserved for residents and staff use. Um, with the surface parking being largely reserved for visitor use. Uh, moving up through the building, the first floor plan is to the right in this slide. Everything you see in blue is part of the 16 unit memory care household. The green uh, area in the middle are a few resident units and then the common area amenities to the north in the yellow include a commercial kitchen, private dining room, uh, two story dining space, a pub, and a little cafe space, along with a grand uh, two-story entry lobby. Moving up through the building on second floor, you've got another household of 16 memory care units with another grouping of um, units outside of that for assisted and independent, and some more common area space to the north, including the community room, library, fitness, uh, theater, and salon. Floors third, third through fifth all um, stack with the same type of units moving up through the building. Uh, around the exterior of the building, we've used a bunch of um, high quality materials and, and really treated this as foresighted architecture. There is no back side to the building, so every face gets the same uh, application of materials and arch architectural articulation. We've included a combination of um, colored architectural masonry, uh, cultured stone, and fiber cement board siding uh, in the panel, and as well with lap siding. These are just a few additional elevations showing their articulation and material use around the building. And this is just a detail slide kind of showing some of those uh, items a little bit closer up in detail, showing the, the articulation of the um, pattern in the spec brick, the cultured stone pattern, um, and some of the details there showing the kind of warm neutral palette in the siding colors as well. This is a rendering uh, along Franlow Road showing kind of what you'd see approaching the site from kind of the vehicular entrance as you kind of come down and into the site. There's a covered port cochere where residents can be picked up and dropped off out of the elements in the weather. Um, and as you can see, many of the resident units have um, decks included for their own personal outdoor enjoyment. Whoop, excuse me, got a little fast with the clicker there. Skipped quite a few forward. Okay, excuse me. Um, this is a rendering shown from Prairie Center Drive showing the, f the water feature kind of in the foreground. Behind that would be a uh, patio space off the two-story dining room. And just to the left of that is an outdoor seating area with grilling um, and fire pit. Uh, back to the further corner, that kind of two-story element you see back there is the common areas for the memory care units. And off of the first floor memory care unit, there's also a private deck there. As we move forward in design, uh, all the buildings that we've done with uh, Southview Senior Living um, has gone through the Excel EDA program, so we'd be looking to optimize all of our energy efficiency measures, looking at everything from window uh, selection and uh, wall insulation through to energy efficient LED lighting, uh, efficient mechanical systems, occupancy sensors, and that sort of thing. Additionally, as just best practices, we often will specify certain levels of um, construction waste management through construction recycling, looking at uh, low or no VOC adhesives um, and paint materials and such like that. Uh, this is, um, as, as I mentioned, the site is a challenging site in itself and as such we uh, needed to request a few waivers, um, one of which being a request for the density uh, increase. Uh, as noted, the staff uh, has 
come up with the great idea of creating a new zoning category that would allow for a little bit more density on this site. We are a little bit over the 40 dwelling units per acre that are allowed within the RM 2.5 zoning district. Um, at, and we currently come in at 43 units per acre. Um, there are a few spots where we kind of uh, get into, be, due to the shape of the site, a few setback encroachments, one being kind of at the inside corner of the building and site, uh, kind of highlighted in blue there. On the southwest corner, we've also got a little bit of an encroachment on the setback there, um, largely in response to the allocation of right-of-way for Medcom Boulevard extension. Uh, we've also got a parking encroachment on the Franlo side, kind of where that parking area overlaps the red zone, which is um, vacated portion that's uh, being put back to the site. And I believe we've got a little bit of parking encroachment on the south side um, as well with the adjacency of the parking drive and parking stalls adjacent to the Medcom Boulevard right away. One of the other wa waivers that we are requesting has to do with parking. Um, the RM 2.5 zoning district is really um, geared towards multifamily housing and not so much as senior housing. There isn't really a good ca zoning category that addresses the needs of senior housing because it really lives very differently from a multifamily housing. Uh, what we've provided or proposed with this proposal is uh, 37 surface stalls, again, primarily for visitors, and then 70 below grade parking stalls for uh, staff and residents, uh, totaling 107 parking stalls at a density ratio, or a parking ratio of 0.92 stalls per unit. We feel this is quite adequate for this type of building, and as you can see with the data provided for both Summit Place and Prairie Bluffs, they're at about 0.8 stalls per unit, so we feel confident that this is um, acceptable and would work very well. Mm -hmm. Another uh, waiver that we've requested is a slight adjustment to parking drive aisle width from 25 feet down to 24 feet and then the parking stall dimensions going down from 19 feet in length to 18 feet in length. Um, these are dimensions that are quite common in other municipalities and we've been uh, told by staff that have been approved on similar projects in the city of Eden Prairie. Another waiver that we are requesting is that of height. Again, the ARM 2.5 zoning district has a height limit of 45 feet. Uh, we are a bit taller than that, um, at heights ranging between 63 foot six and 66 foot eight, but also taking into account the topography of the site, we actually kind of sit down in the landscape quite a bit. This is showing kind of some cross sections cutting through the library down to Joiner Way Strip Mall, and then the other direction kind of through the uh, condo building to the south, and then again towards the kind of northwest, showing that um, we're actually about on par with the condo building to the south when you take into accommodation the uh, um, topography change, and we're actually elevationally, geodactically lower than the Eden Prairie Library. Another waiver that we've applied for is the tree replacement and open space requirements. Uh, as you can see from the included landscaping plan here, we've really striven to um, provide a very robust landscape package, um, but there are quite a few large trees on the site as it is. Um, many of them are actually ash trees, uh, but we've really done, striven to provide as, as much as we can within the site that we've um, got and provide also as much outdoor amenity space as we can for the residents, including kind of just to the northeast corner of the building, uh, grilling and, and outdoor fire pit area, uh, a patio off of that dining space so that uh, indoor and outdoor dining can be accommodated, and then also the private deck off of the memory care and also the private resident decks as well throughout the building. Um, it's been shown pretty consistently amongst all the senior living uh, providers that we've worked with that across the board, senior living projects such as this really draw from a fairly small radius, often maybe two to three miles. So um, I welcome your questions and thank you for your consideration of this project and invite you to help keep the senior, pres senior residents of Eden Prairie in the community that they so love. Thank you. Um, thank you, Mindy. Um, I appreciate the expansion on the sustainability components yeah. because on the staff report of December 6th, it was pretty scanty. So it's nice to see those yeah. listed. Uh, one of the things that wasn't addressed today, and I think it's referenced in the reports, is a uh, possible charging station. Yeah, and that's something that we certainly uh, have talked about and Lance feels comfortable 
um, including in the project. Yeah, yeah. love to see that. Yeah. Okay, Council Member Nelson. Um, are these all rental or are some of these owned units? These will all be rental. Okay. Are, will there be a bus where people can not have to have a car and where they'll take them to a medical facility or then close to the library, but some of your residents might not be able to walk? Or yeah. Will there be something so they don't have to have a car then? Yeah, that's been typical on other projects, and Lance is nodding as yes that confirmed okay. that that would be available. And also, I took a certain amount of time looking through you know the trees and flowers and stuff, and I was happy to see things that were blooming from spring through fall. Mm -hmm. So a fair amount of thought had gone into that to make sure that you had a wide diversity of colored plants, which mm -hmm. I liked a lot. I spent a Thank you. good hour ago with a micro or magnifying glass going through all the little. <laughs> <laughs> uh, Councilmember Butcher Wickstrom. Yeah, I just have a question for sure. you. Uh, and I could have missed something about the elevations. Okay. So, um, my question is, why would there not be some kind of a connection at the back of the site, so that would be the southwest portion of the site that would access Medcom Boulevard? As far as a pedestrian <laughs> access or a vehicular access? Well, I mean, I was thinking pedestrian. Um, and that's where the memory care area is. That, that was yeah. my one worry about that. but. It's so close, and there's so many healthcare um, buildings, you know, on that corner. Mm -hmm. I don't know. Maybe it's just too far to walk. I'm not sure, or, or even, or even if there was some kind of access. I don't sure. know. I'm just curious as to why it wasn't considered. It or wasn't. If it was. <laughs> it wasn't really pushed on largely due to topography change issues, um, but it was. I guess it would be maybe something that we could look at. Um, there's quite a bit of steep. Grade is it too in steep? that area. Okay. Yeah, that's yeah. what I wonder. I mean, you'd probably end up getting quite a bit of stairs, and we didn't want to encroach on the the right of way that was being provided for Medcom. Yeah. Right. <laughs> yeah. Okay. I wondered yeah. about that. Yeah. Uh, anything else? No, that's good. Councilmember Case. Yeah, just a couple questions. Um, mm -hmm. And regarding this road right of way, mm -hmm. um, originally, when I walked the property, I was um, actually inclined. Uh, not to need MedCom right away to extend in there. So mm -hmm. I'm, I'm, I'm glad that um, staff was creative and worked with you and that you were, uh, your project was willing to slide a little bit to the south on the, I don't even know my directions there, west oh. side or something, and then on the east yeah. side to slide it more toward your property yeah. or, or, or something. But, but uh, originally, originally, I was thinking if that right of way was not there, what could a walking bike trail in, in, instead? Because we've always talked about joining neighborhoods and it, it would address exactly what, what you just said, Sherry. So now that the right of way road is there, um, is, is, is there no plan at all for bike trail, walking trail? And could, could a trail be there? I mean, that, that Medcom road likely will never be built but I mean it will be long gone and if it is it's fine but um, so I, I nonetheless I'm thinking indefinitely 15 20 years out uh, could a walking trail be put in now that would connect those neighborhoods and allow what exactly what you're saying cherry access to all the medical facilities so that's yeah. my question I, I have three so well, don't it, can I say something take, sure. yeah. oh yeah. It, it's um piggybacking with Ron I mean we even have bike racks at the Taco Bell because this mm -hmm. is what we're trying to do is mm -hmm. encourage um, people to be healthy and get out and mm -hmm. walk and ride and do whatever mm -hmm. they can. So, I mean, even the Taco Bell, which is right on that joiner way. Mm -hmm. um, so that's why it seems that any kind of yes would be, it's what we've been trying to do. I don't know if it's possible. That's why I was bringing it up. Um, mm -hmm. to see if there was uh, a way we could do that. B because we are looking for it really in every development that we look at. Mm -hmm. Mr. Ellis? Yeah, Madam Mayor, maybe I can just jump in. Ideally, the opportune time to do that is when Medcom Boulevard is extended because it comes with a lot of grading. There's tree impacts. Uh, so there's no doubt that's the best time to do it. I think if uh, the developer were to move forward with some type of a path now, um, 
it's going to involve a lot of work. I don't know the cost, but my guess is it's going to be quite expensive. And it'll probably be infrastructure that gets ripped out when we someday build Eden Prairie, or, uh, excuse me, uh, Medcom Boulevard. I, that's so good. Yeah. I'm okay not doing it. I just thought um, if it was possible to connect now, because I, I kind of don't believe Medcom is going to be built any time within my lifetime, um, and and so I was hoping some kind of a connector. But but I'm 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 fine not. But my I guess my second follow up question that to that is, and I, I may have the answer myself to this, but mm -hmm. is that area where Medcom someday will go? Is that going to all be graded necessary because of the parking on the north side in the building? And if not, there are a couple of really big old trees yep. toward the property line. Mm -hmm. So then my thought is, could they be taken down by a city council 20 years down the way when Medcom, which I don't think is ever going to get built, actually gets built? <laughs> um, and so in the temporary short term of 20 to 30 to 100 years, could the trees stay there? That's, but maybe because of grading, they can't. So I guess I'm asking. Uh, the heritage trees that are right along that area, we've done a lot of work looking at the grading to try and save those. I think there's at least two or three immediately adjacent right there, and those will be preserved. So they're not actually in the potential future right away? I don't believe so. They're either I right thought, next to it. I thought they, they were. Are. Oh, they're, yes. they're right. So, okay. so that's my point. Yeah. If they are, can we they will. stay? Yes. Okay, fantastic. Yeah. And then be taken down someday when Medcom, which I don't think is ever yeah. going to get built, yeah. actually does get built. <laughs> Say it again, um, Rob. Sure. <laughs> <laughs> What's your thought? Yeah, we're so, but anyway, that's great news. I'm Because yeah. those are They're some really nice say. heritage yeah. trees. Yeah. And why take them down if we don't need to for 10 to perfect? Yeah. And then my final question then has to do with affordable housing component. Um, the, the words elderly waiver have not mm -hmm. been used, but is that what we're talking about when we're talking about affordable housing in a senior building? Okay. Lance, do you want to address this in any great the detail? Yes. The answer is yes. Um, okay. He so does, these are he does these are twelve units that will have an elderly waiver component. Is there a um, is there a continuum or a gradation of elderly waiver, meaning uh, certain levels of subsidy, or is it all or nothing? We'll take these twelve units, and whoever moves into them will be allowed. You know, they'll come in without the funds, and we'll allow them to stay forever. Or is there a, a subsidization? You know. Yeah gradation that occurs? I'm trying to think of how to answer that. Um, uh, individuals qualify for elderly waiver essentially when they, their assets are reduced down to $3,000. Right. And then uh, there's a case mix system that uh, the county or the state uses to figure out what rate that they're paid upon. And their, okay. their monthly rent for the apartment, is it 891? 893 $893 a, a month. Yeah, and, and I've, some of us that are gray-haired up here have been through this enough that I, I do have, I guess, sadly, a lot of, a fair amount of knowledge about this. But I right. guess my question, if I was a owner of a building, and some, I w I'm assuming people get qualified in, Correct. and it, so therefore there might be a person, I'm going to make numbers up here, but has $50,000 that, that, and is uh, 82 years old, and you're guessing mm -hmm. that they'll have eight years of payment, and then you will take over, and then there's other people come in with one year of assets, mm -hmm. and so that's where I'm thinking, is there like a continuum where you would... Um, you know, taking a certain amount of people that have no assets right away and a certain amount of people that would last five years and so that kind of a thing. Uh, initially, we'll take the 12, up to 12 individuals potentially that could qualify right away for elderly waiver. And then typically people in the building, as they age, they run out of assets, but we'll always maintain. Got it. Perfect. You answered it. Okay. Thank you so much. You don't kick anybody out. No. Well, that, in those 12 but units, you absolutely. Yeah, right. No, we don't. No. Thank Good. you. Any other questions? I, ha I just had a, I was just gonna, wondering about um, what is the mix? Do you have, uh, you have memory care? Uh, how, how many, how, what's the mix between independent assisted and memory care? Uh, there are two households of 16 in the memory care for a total of 32, uh, then 44 independent units and 40 assisted. Great. Mm -hmm. Well, nice. very, very nice mix and we're really looking forward to the project. Anything Thank else? We'll have a public Great. Hearing now. Great. Um, this is a public hearing. Is there anyone from oops? Is there anyone from the audience that wants to address the council on this development? If you'd come to the podium and give your name and address for the record. Good evening, Mayor and City Council members, and thank you for this time this evening. My name is Terry Brown, 
My address is 11896 Germain Terrace in Eden Prairie. I'm also the owner of Unit 106 in the Eden Hills Condominium Building at 8500 Franlow Road, which is adjacent to the proposed development project where my disabled daughter resides. I'd like to advise the council up front that I am not opposed to the development project proposed by Southview Senior Communities. I believe this residential pr project is consistent and compatible with the existing developments in this area, especially the area to the south of this project along Franlow Road, which is completely residential. Additionally, from what I have heard from the Southview organization in prior meetings and subsequently read about their operations, I believe they will be a good neighbor to Eden Hills. However, as we've, you guys have taken all my bluster away with your discussion around the trees, there are a few things that uh, do stand out for me on this project uh, and the uh, extension of Medcom Boulevard through this area that I think are inconsistent with city's land use objectives and the city's major center area study guidelines. First, as you know, the two of the land parcels that are proposed in this project are heavily wooded natural land sites that contain well over 150 trees, many of which are mature, and some are heritage, as has been discussed, as defined in section 11.55 of the city code. The remaining parcel with an existing building and landscaped area also contains many mature trees. With the proposed development project and the city's anticipated plan to extend Medcom Boulevard, the vast majority, if not all, of the mature trees will be removed happy to hear that they're going to try to save a few of those uh, in the process in the short term. This action appears to conflict with the language in Chapter 11 of the City Code under land use regulation objectives that states to safeguard and enhance the appearance of the city, including natural amenities of hills, woods, lakes, and ponds. Additionally, the major center area study states open spaces and amenities supported by public and private resources are needed to make the town center area and major center area livable, attractive, and a success over the next 25 years. With approval of this project in its current form and the Medcom Boulevard extension, the city will be eliminating the last remaining natural wooded area within the major center area. Beyond the apparent conflict with city stated objectives, the removal of this entire wooded area to accommodate the Southview project and the Medcom Boulevard extension will eliminate the benefit that the roughly 200 trees in this area provides, which is reducing the air pollution effect created by, more than the, by the more than 12,000 vehicles that pass through this area each day. Second, specific to the Medcom Boulevard extension, the city land use <coughs> objectives include foster har a harmonious, convenient, workable relationship between land uses to promote a safe and effective traffic circulation system, to protect and enhance real property values, to safeguard and enhance the appearance of the city, including natural amenities of hills, woods, lakes, and ponds. Madam Mayor and Council Members, if the city chooses to build Medcom, the Medcom Road extension through this area, it will violate all of the aforementioned city land use objectives. Placing a roadway within 50 feet of a residential building, increasing traffic in a residential area does not promote a harmonious environment, will create more safety issues, will reduce property values, and does not safeguard the city's natural habitat. It's my understanding the Southview Communities Organization was required to reconfigure their original building site plans and commit land for the Medcom Boulevard extension in order to gain approval from city agencies for their project. If the project was approved as originally submitted and without the Medcom Boulevard extension, a number of trees on this property could be saved and the conflicts with city land use objectives could be avoided. I respectfully ask that you carefully consider these points in your decision regarding the final development plans for the Southview project and the Medcom Boulevard extension. Thank you for allowing me this time tonight. Thank you. Anybody else? Members of the council, my name is Peter Westerhaus, and I represent Mariana Scottis LLC, which is the legal entity that owns the two southern parcels of the property. Uh, my brother John, who's also in the audience, 
uh, and I are the only two owners of that uh, uh, LLC. Uh, we've owned those parcels since 2000 and uh, brought, bought the party, or brought, bought the property from my parents uh, who had a house on it in 1960. Uh, we grew up on the property, and in fact, uh, graduated and uh, played football with Principal McCartan. <laughs> no, no Unfortunately, kidding. we did not win one of those state titles, but um, I'm familiar with the, the area is the point. Uh, we also own a business in Eden Prairie uh, since 1990 and have 35 employees. A pleasure visited. Yeah. you visited. And You're one of our first meet and greets. Greatly yeah. appreciate that outreach to the business community, so thank you. Uh, I'm here tonight to speak in favor of the developer, Southview Senior <clears throat> Communities. Uh, Southview has an excellent experience and integrity, and they do what they say they'll do. This is the 10th serious developer we've worked with for this property in the 17 years we've owned it. And we've had others, dozens of others actually nibble at it. So we know it's a highly desirable property in our downtown. But obviously, as been said, it has challenges, and those are slope, trees, pondings, everything that's been mentioned. But in our experience, far and away, the biggest challenge is Medcom Boulevard and the variable of Medcom Boulevard. I think I can say that we are confused and very concerned by the city's position on Medcom, which was drawn in some 40 years ago. It has been a cloud over the property that entire time, including as it passed my parents' house and wondering, wondering what would it become and when. So we understand that neighbors and future owners would have that same concern over that cloud. It raises three questions that we'd like to pose to you tonight. Why does the city want it, given, given declining traffic, enormous expense, and the environmental impact? Two, why was MedCom required for a project we brought forward last year, but after study, the city backed down from building it? And three, now with this project, why does the city require right of way for this without hard evidence it's needed or ever will be? We request that the city not require MedCom right of way or at a minimum turn it into a walking bike path as been mentioned for the pleasure of Eden Prairie residents. Thank you. Thank you. Anybody else that wants to testify here? Hearing none, is there a motion to close the public hearing? Could we I, just close the public hearing? Yeah, Yeah, I would just make no. a motion to close the public hearing. Second. All in favor? Aye. 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 The motion passes. Uh, discussion, Mr. Case, you have your light on. Yeah, I, I don't want to belabor this long. I'm, I'm ready to um, vote for That's this right. this evening. I just wanted to say that I, I too struggled with many of the feelings that both uh, people that came to speak had. Um, and. Um, when I walked the property, I, I, I mean, I had the sense that it clearly is a high-density residential property. It's no longer, you know, single-family homes. And that being said, then, whatever goes in there will take the trees out. And this looks like a great project to put a lot of trees back in. Uh, Medcom, I, as, as I've noted tonight, I have serious, <laughs> which I don't believe is going to be built. I, did you get that? I have, again. <laughs> <laughs> I have serious uh, questions about the need for it, but I'm going to completely defer to the fact that staff and the developer came to agreement. So I, I'm pleased, and, and I will go forward with you know, the idea that if it needs to get built someday, a future council, probably none of us will, will deal with um, whatever public reaction at the time that brings out, um, and they'll face that. But um, I'm, I'm happy um, for what's been negotiated, and, and I, I think this is a really good project for this um, small parcel that, that will be a benefit and an amenity to the city. So, um, I'm, I'm, but I, I empathize completely. We're tree lovers, I mean, absolutely. I, I'm saddened with tree loss, but uh, sometimes it has to be, and then the mitigation uh, attempts are, I think, are, are really good in this case. And if we can save a couple of heritage trees for a decade or more, forever, because <laughs> the world will never get built, um, then that's a really good thing. <laughs> All right, um, Mr. Ellis, do you have anything you want to add to any of those questions at the end? 
Madam Mayor, I can try to address those. You know, I, I just want to reiterate, tonight we're just talking about the right-of-way, and we've talked about right-of-way for Medcon Boulevard for years, maybe decades. Uh, so it preserves that opportunity because never's a long time. Mm -hmm. And you look at that property off Joiner Way, Medcom Boulevard, mm -hmm. it's aged, it's a little tired, but there's an opportunity there to do something nice, something elevate nice, uh, where you have mixed use, you have a lot of density, uh, something that would be very attractive for Eden Prairie. And if you don't preserve this opportunity for access, you're gonna hamstring yourself in trying to approve a project like that because you will have access, we will have access problems at some point in the future on Flying Cloud Drive and on Prairie Center Drive. They're two of the busiest roadways we have in Eden Prairie. So we just wanna preserve that opportunity for a future council to at least engage a developer in trying to do something very nice down there. And if and when that road goes in, there will be ample opportunity to engage the neighborhood on the design, uh, how trees can be saved or mitigation can be included in the project and also for the city council to weigh in on. So those decisions will have opportunities for public input in the future, but if we don't preserve the right of way now, then we've lost an opportunity for not only this project, but for other redevelopment that will happen at some point in the future in this area. Uh, is there a motion? Yes, I move to close the public hearing and adopt a resolution amending the guide plan from regional commercial to high density residential on 2.58 acres and amending the comprehensive plan text to include a land use category allowing over 40 dwelling units per acre and adopt a resolution for a planned unit development concept review on 2.58 acres and approve the first reading of the ordinance for planned unit development district review with waivers and a zoning district change from rural to RM-2.5 on 2.58 acres and direct staff to prepare a development agreement incorporating staff and commission recommendations and council conditions. Second. Including the charging station. Including the charging station. It, and the mayor add too, because that the, the mayor mentioned the charging station. So there are, and they're in the staff report, there are a number of commission, minor commission revisions. So Sherry captured that in her motion, but the charging station, I think there were some comments that you see in the report related to um, a compact car stall, a tree protection around a particular tree number, um, moving a blue spruce, and then at the end as well, to um, which may eliminate the tree replacement waiver if you um, stop the caliper inches at 119 inches, then there would be a pavement, a payment into the tree fund as um, updated in your prior ordinance that might eliminate that waiver. So that would all come back at uh, second reading. All right, um, we had a second? Yes. All in favor? Aye. 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 Motion passes. Uh, payment of claims. Excellent. Good. Congratulations. Thank Congratulations. You. Congratulations. Welcome. We're excited call. to see it. Yeah, we really are. We need it. Thank you. Uh, payment of claims, is there a motion for approval? So moved. Second. second. Any items to question? Uh, roll call, please. Councilmember Alho. Aye. Councilmember Butcher Wickstrom. Aye. Councilmember Case. Aye. Councilmember Nelson. Aye. Mayor Tara Lukens. Aye. Any other business to bring before the council? Uh, May, maybe Mayor, one announcement that our next meeting would normally be the first Tuesday in February, uh, February 6th, but that's being moved to Monday, February 5th, due to uh, statewide precinct caucuses and uh, city not being able to or should not conduct business on that evening. So the next meeting is Monday, February 5th. Okay. okay. Great, thank you. Is there a motion to adjourn? So move. Second. All in favor? Aye. Aye. Meeting adjourned.